On this episode of In the Gun, it's time to preview the upcoming weekend action. The Kansas Jayhawks roll to town. Two programs, two teams, two fan bases desperately looking for a W. We'll discuss how the Mountaineers can get things done against the Jayhawks. All of that and more on this edition of ITG. You are now watching Believe. ITG. With Wes, Owen, and Jed. I've got the best teammates in the business here, all right? No way! They both played the game. They both know the game. Owen is the runaway beer truck known for having some fun. Owen Schmidt, you have a podcast in the gun. Owen Schmidt, like a runaway beer truck down the sidelines! Jed is the signal caller who is... The X's and O's and the and the brainiac. First of all, Jed's research is pretty impressive. So we've combined those two skill sets. Skills I've acquired over a very long career. You are in the gun. Once you enter this family, no getting out. In the gun, episode 191 of your new favorite WVU football podcast. I am Wes Euler with the best teammates in the business. The beer truck, Big O, Owen Schmidt, and of course the signal caller, our favorite brainiac and poet and analyst, Jed Drenning. And as always, this episode of ITG brought to you in part by our friends at Bet Online, your number one source for everything football. Bet Online, the game starts here. And gentlemen, it is a high noon kickoff for the Mountaineers hosting the Jayhawks. In the first, uh, their first Big 12 game of the season, and Jed, I think it's safe to say, I think it's fair to say, you've got uh, you've got two teams, two programs, two universities, two coaching staffs, two groups of players, two groups of fan bases that are pretty desperate to get a win on Saturday. There's no doubt about it, and we we have a lot in common with this program at this juncture. They really climbed the ranks and received a lot of hype and love. You know, we, we thought that we were getting a little bit of hype heading into the season. We were picked seventh in the conference. Well, they were picked ahead of us. But there were some looming questions <clears throat> that needed to be answered. They had to replace Andy Kudelnicki. They did so with Jeff Grimes, who the last several years has been at Baylor. He was part of Baylor's conference championship there. They were in a handful of years ago. Uh, in addition to that, you know, their, their preseason quarterback or offensive player of the year last year, Jalen Daniels, hadn't really played for the better part of a year coming into the season. He only played the first handful of games last year. And next thing you know, those questions haven't been answered. Uh, they're out to a one two start. They had a tough road trip to Illinois where I'll be honest with you. And, and Phil Steele positioned this pretty accurately. It felt as though Illinois spent their off season making that game, their Super Bowl, And it really showed on the field. Um, and then, you know, as if the honeymoon needed any more reason to be over <clears throat> last week, when you think of Lance Leipold, you, you think of a guy who has all these crazy sellouts at the booth, right? Well, Nebraska gets a sellout right after Kansas only had 20,000 people at a home game. Lance Leipold's wife weighs in on social media, must be nice. And then you go out a few days later and lose to, again, I think UNLV is a good football team. Uh, a salty good football team uh but they're g5 nonetheless kansas was favored so they come in at one and two west virginia comes in at one and two a whole different direction not all one and twos are created equally but both very different uh you know paths to get here but th that's kind of where we are and guys they're a, they're a veteran team a very veteran team uh that's bolstered by what some believe to be the best recruiting class they've had in the modern age and if you remember, they had a lot of seminal moments over the stretch of a year and a half, beating Texas the week before we went out there in Lawrence in 2021. Uh, well, the win on the road in Morgantown was a huge win for them. It was a huge win for Jalen Daniels. That was another win in which they turned the corner. They started off with that unbeaten start. They got game day to Lawrence after smoking Houston. Um, so, yeah, we were up 28-14 in that game and found a way to uh, – to lose in overtime 55 to 42 but we're going to get into both sides of the ball and then some special teams but but by and large an interesting matchup because it's two teams that really need this yeah big o uh desperation for both sides two dogs one bone uh who's going to respond being backed into a corner here yeah i mean 
this is a must win in, in my opinion. Uh it's the first conference game of the season uh for, for these two teams. And uh like I said, it, it's it's put up or shut up. We we've had our tests, right? We've had our tryouts. We have hey. Hey, you guys coming to the tree outs today? Um, you know, <laughs> you show up at the it's like it's the, the tree outs, you. dude. What's the tree out? The team needs you. Um, but it, it's it's time, like I said, to nut up or shut up. There's no more do overs here. You know, uh, we can still salvage yep. a lot of this season uh, and really get the ball rolling with with a good victory uh, this weekend. But it. it we got to we got to muster up something dude i yeah. know i know there's a lot of doom and gloom right now um but we got to forgive and forget and and we got to come in this weekend absolutely hair on fire yeah completely agree and you know you make a good point there i know neil brown said it this week i know garrett green said it this week that uh as much as it stings all their goals in terms of winning the Big 12 and making a college football play, playing in a Big 12 championship game, winning the Big 12, making college football playoff are still in front of them. And as a fan base, right, after a heart-wrenching, gut-punch type loss to your biggest rival, you don't want to hear that. But you know what? If you go out and you take care of business in that first conference game um, against a team who has given us problems recently, given us hell recently, last time we played these guys in Morgantown, as Jed mentioned, um, they beat us in what was a big moment for them as a program early on in the season. So, yeah, you know what? Um, Win that first conference game, and then maybe, you know, everyone looks up and says, hey, big opportunity against Oklahoma state this weekend. Your goals really are still in front of you. Let's get rolling here now. And, and, and let's, let's get this thing on track. Uh, I think that's a good point by you there as well too, big O. It's easy to sit here after we're one and two. And as we talked about in the last episode, man, we need to see a lot of things that we have yet to see a lot of things, right? Owen. I mean, we've almost seen nothing we need to see from this football team, very little spurts here and spurts there, which we'll get into, but this new age, if somebody finds a way to suddenly play their best football that they haven't played yet through the non-conference schedule, in the past, if you got off to a slow start, a sluggish start, you were one and two, you're done. There's there's no grand dance to play for at the end of the season. You're done. You're trying to jockey for some kind of bull angle, right? I mean, think back in 2002 or 2003 when you know we lost the opener to Wisconsin, uh, beat East Carolina lost to a bad Cincinnati team in a sloppy, awful game in the rain in Morgantown, <laughs> got blown out by Maryland. Well, we almost beat Miami and then went on a run. Well, in the modern age, if you find a way to stop looking sloppy and bad and go on a run and play your best football and show the world that's not who we are, what you've seen so far, now, unlike all those previous years, there's a prize dangling at the end. Two teams go to Dallas. Who those might be? I mean, Arizona State sitting here at three and zero after they were picked fourteen. I have no idea. I'm not forecasting we will do that. What I'm saying is the new reality of college football, which never existed until this year, erased you with a start like this. Yeah. Period. No matter what you turned around or no matter how much better you got, you were erased. Yeah, you, you've actually got a margin and, for error. No you've got a margin case. for error now. Something that never existed in the past. Yeah. yeah. So at least. Yeah. If you do work the miracle of turning it around and finding it a way to go on a run, at least if you if you find a way to do all those things, uh, we're not saying we will or we won't. That's not my point. Somebody's going to do that, and somebody's now going to be rewarded, some team that wasn't rewarded before because of the structure of the new 12-team playoff. But, uh, again, we haven't even played a conference game yet. So if our best football is ahead of us, which it absolutely better be, then – Let's stack them up one at a time and see what happens. That's really all you can do. That's all you can do. What, are you just going to fold Yeah. and say, heck with this, we're one and two? I mean, this is a lost cause. We haven't played a single conference game yet, but it's a lost cause. Come on, you know, improve to the extent that you can, look up and see what happens. I, I, I don't know what we can or can't do. I just know that we haven't looked like a very good football team. We've looked like a bad football team through three games. Can we rectify that and turn it around? And if you do, it's not like in the past there's something all of a sudden down the stretch to play for more so than, you know, a decent bowl game. Yeah. And it starts Saturday at high noon, right? 
got to got to start there, got to start somewhere. Um, and that is where uh, the next opportunity lies for these Mountaineers still early. I mean, you'll even after Saturday, you'll only be a quarter of the way through this season. So a lot of football left to play. What does it have to look like for WVU against Kansas? If it is going to start that pendulum going to swing in the Mountaineers favor and start to build something here at Milan Pushkar Stadium, Mountaineer Field on Saturday afternoon. We'll get into all of that when we return on the other side. A thanks to our friend JR and everybody there at Team 2. We all know cars cost less and graft. And we'll get into the X's and the O's, the schematics, the personnel of the Mountaineers and the Jayhawks when we return. You are in the gun. For nearly 20 years, Fortis has been the nation's leader in providing guaranteed roof performance programs for commercial buildings. Fortis offers roof performance solutions that feature extensive initial and ongoing reconditioning for commercial buildings as an alternative to traditional replacement with long-term performance guarantees that are backed by global leader Lloyds of London. Fortis offers a comprehensive range of roof performance management programs that provide financial security, extend the life of our customers' roofs, and make a significant impact on ROI. Fortis is currently improving performance and increasing ROI for customers at more than 4,800 locations, with more than 140 million square feet protected, including many Fortune 500 companies that have turned to Fortis to save money, gain financial certainty, and extend the life of their existing roofs. Fortis has helped customers save more than $520 million in capital roof replacement costs for an average ROI of over 250%. To learn more, visit fortis.us.com. Fortis, roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. Nobody supports the blue and gold Mountaineers like Toothman Ford. With over 20 NIL deals and counting, Toothman Ford continues to rally behind our student athletes. And it's time we rally and support the dealer that supports the Mountaineers. Not only does Toothman Ford offer the best prices in the state on pre-owned, their never over MSRP campaign on new Fords guaranteed to, to save you thousands. thousands. Drive with pride all season long, knowing you're supporting the dealer that fuels our Mountaineers. Toothman Ford, we're car Cars cost less in Grafton and at Toothman4.com. Back in the gun here as it's time to turn the page. It's time to set the stage for Mountaineers Jayhawks Saturday, Milan Pushkar Stadium, Mountaineer Field, high noon kickoff for Kansas and WVU, two teams as we discussed in the open that are desperate for a victory. Jed, let's start uh, our personnel breakdown here with the signal caller. WVU offense, Kansas defense, uh, the Mountaineers Man, they scored 34 points on Saturday and uh, felt like could have easily had more as well, too, if they would have maybe just finished one or two more drives and if they would have maybe uh, gotten one or two more uh, favorable decisions along the trenches and the line of scrimmage that called back a touchdown. Um, so let's let's start uh, Kansas defense, WVU offense, that side of the football, if you don't mind, dear signal caller. Absolutely, yeah, and, and we've had some success against Bo Borland's defenses before. Yes, Kansas has a new offensive coordinator, but their defensive coordinator returns. He's been with Lance Leipold a long time since their D3 days up in Wisconsin. Uh, but they might be a veteran team, but where they took the most hits and where they've tried to retool and rebuild is in their front seven. Uh, they have some new additions there, some guys that are being asked to play more or play for the first time. Uh, but there's some talent. I mean, some things jump out at you on tape. Uh, when you're looking for some answers there, you got a linebacker in J.B. Brown. He's flying around making some plays. Uh, you you got uh, another linebacker in Cornell Wheeler. He's very disruptive and athletic, makes some things happen. Uh, he leads them in tackles, already has three TFLs. They're having a lot more uh, success penetrating uh, and, and knocking you off schedule a little bit with some TFLs than they did last year. So they're stacking up some of those. And they got a kid, Tommy Dunn. I don't even know if he's necessarily considered a full-time starter, but he's an interior defensive lineman. He's one of those 6'3", 300-plus-odd pounds. Uh, he was I was very impressed with him against UNLV. He was very disruptive. Big kid there. Uh, they got an edge guy, Dean Miller, already a sack and a half. He's making some things happen. Uh, you got another edge guy, Jareem Robinson, two and a half sacks. So they'll get after you up, up with their with their new front seven. But where their strongest guys is on that back end. They're, they're very – veteran and battle tested it seems like kobe bryant's been around forever at this program that's who had the pick six and overtime against jt daniels two years ago uh he's been he's a great football player uh and he kind of anchors down that unit they, they got two really good corners him and mellow dotson are both really solid athletic corners that are playmakers for him and they got a, a tandem of safeties and oj burrows and marvin grant that'll smack you they'll make some things happen so they really lean on that back end now 
uh, unlike what we saw last week with Narduzzi and Pitt, they, they don't get after you in the sense in terms of throwing numbers at you from a blitz standpoint. I think that I only counted five or six times they, you know, on dropbacks, they blitzed that UNLV kid uh, last week. So uh, he'll pick his spots, but not nearly what we saw last week. Uh, so you're going to see some zone and you're going to have to diagnose and attack that. Now, one of the things worth mentioning here, it's, it's, it's a big picture thing. And we hit on this last week. West Virginia is dead last in the Big 12 offensively in third down success at 25%. All right. But we've said that's misleading. Neil doesn't focus on that. So many third and sixes, he's looking for a fourth and two and go for it. In turn, guys, we don't only we've converted 83 percent of our fourth down tries and we've attempted more than anybody in the country. So don't read too much into the third down number because we, we do oftentimes see it as a four down proposition. And if you want to see something. If, if you watched us through the first three games, it obviously offensively doesn't look like last year's offense in a handful of multiple different ways, right? But one of the things that if you really take a deep dive and watch tape and try and find some numbers to support it, I just got the sense that Garrett didn't seem to be, at first blush, taking off as many times as he did last year. There's There's different reasons you'll take off, okay? That's where the conversation starts there. He's not scrambling as much as he did last year. So now let's start the conversation. Let's get into the why. All right. When you scramble, you scramble. There, there's multiple reasons. You can scam, scramble because there's pressure and you're flushed out. And an athletic kid like Garrett, you know, he's going to hit the escape hatch, break, contain, and go. So pressure will force you to scramble, but also coverage. If they lock down on the back end and plaster and you don't have a throwing lane um, and you don't like the way the route's developing, uh, you might take off for that reason. Instead of a covered sack, it's a covered scramble, right? But the third one's what I want to focus on. And a lot of people call it a hole in the zone. And that's neither of the first two. You're not taking off because you have to because of pressure. You're not taking off because you have to because of the coverage. You're taking off just because you see a crease that looks too inviting not to. You can hang around, see if the route develops. It's not like the pocket's collapsing around you. You still got time, but you just see a very tempting path, and you take off and go. So now that I've defined the terms, let's talk, let's talk some numbers. Garrett, this year, all told, all types of scrambles through three games. How many times do you think he scrambled? Just take a guess. Oh, a dozen? Four. Yeah, I was going to say 15, maybe. Four times. Now, of those four, only one was because there was a hole in the zone. He picked up six yards. All right. Now, let's look at last year, what was playing out. Four times. Last year, all three games. Is that what you're saying? Four, four, yeah, that's correct. Just you four. are correct, though. Four times in three games. Yep. Total. Well, I'll okay. tell you the problem. So now let's scramble more. <laughs> well, again, let's get into the wild. Owen, <laughs> Owen, <laughs> Owen, 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 those are rookie numbers in this racket. We got to pump those numbers up. Yeah. Yeah, Let's get well, yeah. Into the hey, hey, buddy. Hey. How many times a game do you think he was scrambling last year? Six a game. Yeah, I mean, uh, at least eight, three and a half. And it makes hmm. a huge difference. Now let's think about this. So you so, so you're saying year, you know some of the plays that they called him to actually run. So that's what you're saying. Those are designed quarterback runs. They're not scrambling. Those are completely different things. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I didn't know you knew the plays. So I was just, you know, I mean, you watch tape, you can see the play. You see what I'm saying? Okay, okay, He's Jedworth. He's Jedworth. All right, don't question it. I mean, you can see a quarterback counter, a quarterback draw. I mean, it, I need to. Quit there has to be some sort of controversy now. on this show, and I'm bringing it. Okay, I love it. I love it. So last year, again, so far this year, 42 total scramble yards in three games total. He's averaging 14 a game. Guys, last year. Hey, like Wes said, those scrambled. are rookie numbers. We need to get those way up. We've got to pump those numbers up in this racket. He scrambled for 332 yards last year. Total, four touchdowns. He averaged three and a half scrambles a game for 30 yards. So far this year, he's averaging 14. That 16 is a big deal. That's a big deal. And here's why. His hole in the zone scrambles last year, 
guys, he was doing it on average just over once a game, but he was averaging 9.9 yards per rush when he did it. When he saw a hole in his own and took off, 9.9 yards per carry, and he had eight first downs when he did it. That is a massive part of his game that's been missing. So once again, I'm not saying scrambling because you're under pressure. I'm not saying scrambling because the coverage holds up. I'm saying it's sometimes when you're trying to become more. Are you saying just take what the defense gives you, Jed? Is that what you're saying? Well, here's what I'm saying. Sometimes when you're trying to become more of a refined passer, you're more inclined to hang on to the football and not take off. I mean, all off season here at 53%, you're not hitting your drop downs, 53%, you're not hitting your drop downs. So part of it is he's going to give those drop downs a little more of a chance than he did last year. But I think over the course of time, that's going to change and he's going to get back to what he was doing last year. That's why you don't listen to all those people, right? Because it's about wins, okay? And if you're not winning, I don't care how good of a passer you are, okay, you're irrelevant. So that's what I see unfolding. But to me, that's a very intriguing part. As I'm watching Tate, okay, and I see him plant his foot, he scans the field, he hits his primary read, he hits his secondary read, he's hanging around a little while. I mean, I could find, I can't run out. I mean, this, this just in, breaking news. But I can see holes, and sometimes they're there, but I get it. He's he's looking a little longer than he did before as he tries to refine himself as a passer, but I'm convinced as we move forward, you'll get to see a little bit of both of those things. A more refined passer and the guy who still sees a seam and takes off once or a little over once a game and picks up a first down, which so far we have I can't done. wait till it happens. Yeah, it hasn't happened yet. So, Big key. Now, I'll be honest with you. I didn't see any lanes against Penn State that he could do it. But in the last two games, I've seen a couple. You know what I mean? I've seen a couple. So, there's that. And then finally, let's close with this. Uh, we, we talked about their personnel. We talked about what they do defensively from a structural standpoint. What really hurt them last year? What really – they managed to win nine football games. And in some respect, it's kind of remarkable that they did with some of the deficiencies that they suffered. Guys, their red zone defensively, their red zone defensive touchdown percentage last year when they let the opposition get into the red zone, 70% of the time they scored a touchdown. Easily the worst in the Big 12. Easily. So they spent the offseason looking to rectify that. And it's fun when you watch the Illinois game, you see them making some plays they didn't make last year. I mean, that's why they hung around that Illinois game. They had two stops in the red zone and didn't let them in the end zone. And last year, that's the type of thing that they weren't making. Uh, that's why it was a close game in Champaign. But this year, guys, it's not 70%. Through three games, it's down to 22%, which is in the top 10 of the country. So they've really taken a step there. They're making better plays when the field shrinks inside the 20 than what I saw on tape from what they were making last year. So that's that's a pretty impressive thing that we're going to get into some turnover numbers because that's going to play a big part of this. But I'm I'm kind of saving that for later. But but uh, that's that's big picture what I've seen. You know, I think it's a pretty good uh pretty good start there certainly. Um and yeah, uh cool. I tell you what, I want, what are your thoughts on this? The last thing I'll toss is out. When we run outside zone, I'm going to give you outside zone and inside zone. Outside zone, we're averaging seven yards a carry, even. Inside zone, which we run a lot more of, uh, we're averaging 6.7 a carry. And then, once again, when we run Q draw, when we run the designed quarterback draw, when he's supposed to take off, we're averaging 13.4 yards per quarterback draw. 121 yards rushing in the Big 12 that leads the Big 12, so is the 13.4 yard average. Now, the thing about Q draw, you got to pick your spots. It's not the type of thing. Like, we ran it twice in a row against Pitt last week, and it worked both times. You can't often do that. You really got to pick your spots. And if you pick your spots meticulously enough, it'll usually work. And that's so far what we've been able to do. So, Owen, what do you think about the outside zone, inside zone? Seven yards of crack. This is a combination of all runners. 6.7 on inside zone. I mean, we're, we're making some hay there, right? No, I mean, I have no problem with our – our outside inside run game as far as the zone the the zone uh game goes look the zone is all about running the zone right you just you keep hammering it you keep hammering it you keep hammering it eventually you break a big one um 
you know, and, and once those guys on the outside start really understanding like their role in the outside and inside zone run game, once they start hanging on just a little bit more, that's when you're going to really start seeing those big runs come. I, like, like I said, I, we can run the football, man. We can absolutely run the football and, and seven, six yards average a play is a, uh, is a very hefty um, average as far as a ground game goes. So like I said, I'm all for it. I just, you got to run it consistently. Right. And over time it breaks over time. The levy breaks. So I think we just need to keep doing what we're doing. And yeah. like I said, once you start seeing those downfield guys, once you see those outside guys really get involved and hang on a little bit, then you start seeing the big ones break. Yeah, and you know what, Owen, the piggyback history was. Well, yeah. <laughs> he's talking about the outside zone. We're getting ready to talk about Jeff Grimes. There but you go. go. That's exactly right. Well, no, I was just going to say, um, to piggyback off of what Owen said there, I think against Pitt we had like six or seven runs that were of 10 or more yards, but only one of those went for more than 15 yards. So to get to Owen's point, just to, to back up Owen's point, they have done a good job of running the football, but they haven't hit the home runs yet that they were hitting last season either. Yeah. Uh, Jaheim and Garrett hit a lot of home runs last season. And even uh, CJ had a, a long touchdown run down in Orlando against uh, UCF. Um, they haven't had those yet this season. Uh, kind of maybe the final element there to take that thing over the top. A lot of that starts to happen when the wideouts start derailing guys. Yeah. Well, and that's Absolutely. what I was saying. Once those guys really get on board with what they need to do out there and can hang on just a little bit longer, you know what I'm saying? Just strain a little bit more. Straining everything you got. Got to strain, dog. Jed knows about straining. All about straining. I know about straining, but not on the outside zone, I don't. <laughs> hey guys uh before we spin the block here and talk uh kansas offense in this post andy kotelnecki era against the wvu defense uh a thank you to our friends at fortis and our guy rick lewis gentlemen i tell you what uh i got a text from rick lewis today he was none too pleased with me he goes you know dude i, figure, I, I know where this is I, going dude i heard you were in denver this weekend and you didn't hit me up well, you know what that what the he double hockey sticks is going on here brother um, and I said to him, I said, Rick, I, I totally messed up. I said, that's on me. I said, but to be fair though, right. It's, it's a, you know, when I go on the road with the Steelers, it's a very in and out business trip. You know, we're there for like 36 hours type thing. It's a, you, you know, get there Saturday, leave Sunday, very quick in and out. I also said though, to be fair, there was nothing on my mind, but the backyard brawl, like <laughs> there could have been, there could have been a, a, a billion dollar Powerball ticket sitting on the ground. And I wouldn't have noticed Rick. I apologize, but there was nothing on my mind, but the backyard brawl on Saturday, I could have been in Denver, in West Virginia, in Pittsburgh, in California, in Europe or in Asia. And I would have only been focused on the backyard brawl. So my apologies to our buddy, Rick Lewis, I owe him one. Uh, we might be able to link up in Vegas though later in the year. We were texting about that potentially. So did he keep tell you that he's been to that, that WVU bar? He's been uh, to a game with that WVU bar. Did he tell you has that? He? We did not know. Actually, yeah. we did not talk yeah. about that. Yeah. No, we were we were talking about Zach Frazier a little bit, and you know, talking about about yeah. the game, but uh, not that bar yeah. specifically. Um, but yeah, fantastic time there for everybody who missed it. Uh, if you blocked out the, if you didn't listen to the pit recap episode, which honestly. Don't blame you. I mean, I probably wouldn't want to relive that either. I would have probably skipped it as well if I could have. Uh, big shout out again to everybody at the Grateful Gnome, the bar, the WVU bar in uh, Denver. If you are a Mountaineer fan, alumni, anything in between, and you find yourself out in the Denver area, I highly recommend a mountain layer lager and a sandwich from uh, from the Grateful Gnome brewery there, certainly. Uh, but Jed, let's spin the block here. Uh, like I mentioned, this is... Not our father's Kansas offense. That sounds weird because it's only been, you know, a few years of Andy Kotelnecki. But it's not even it's, our brothers. It's the first it's, <laughs> not, it's uh it's the first uh the first time we've seen Kansas here, you know, in the post Andy Kotelnecki era. Um uh, the very talented offensive coordinator that was with Kansas for so long that of course now is the OC at Penn State that we just saw in Morgantown uh a few weeks ago. So what do we expect from this? A uh, lot of same names and, and elements, but in also a way, new look Kansas offense. 
Yeah, a lot of pieces remain intact. Uh, a lot of experience. Um, at every position on the offensive side of the football. But Jeff Grimes, it wasn't long after Andrew, Andy Kotelnicki made the announcement in December he was leaving for Penn State that they 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 grabbed Jeff Grimes and said, come on over. Uh, you're the next contestant in Lawrence, Kansas. Because, you know, he was jettisoned in Waco, and it was this game of musical chairs where Dave Aranda brings in our old buddy Jake Spavital was his new OC. So shiny and new on both sides, on both fronts. This is a guy who kind of fell out of favor with the uh, the Baylor fandom in the last couple of years, but he was an instrumental part just a short few years ago in them making that run to the Big 12 championship. Um, what you're going to get is, is what you've seen out of a Baylor. He was at BYU before that. It's it's a lot of creativity. It's a lot of motion. It's a lot of movement. You're going to see jet motion. You're going to see orbit motion. You're going to see shifts. Uh, he's going to test your eyes. There's going to be a ton of movement uh, to test the, the defense's eye, eye discipline. Uh, there's going to be a lot of play action. He's going to move the launch point of the quarterback. So it's going to be difficult to hit him. They're one of the least sacked teams in the Big 12 for that reason. It's tough to get to his quarterback. And Owen, he he predicates his RVO offense. Remember at Baylor, he called it the RVO, the reliable, violent offense. So much of it's predicated on the outside zone. He builds it on the outside zone. He's a big believer. He always has been. Huge proponent of the outside zone. Uh, Devin Neal. We talk about him all the time. Owen's boy, 3,000 plus yards rushing in his career. He has a chance to be the all time school's all time career leading rusher. He's as impressive as he ever was. When you watch him on tape, he's still making things happen. Even when you think somebody has him down, averaging 5.6 yards after contact, that's number two in the conference. He's shifty, he's a handful, he's tough in space, and he's tough in, in close spaces for that matter. But Kansas, Owen, we talk about West Virginia's numbers. Kansas averages seven and a half yards per carry on the outside zone, which minimum 20 carries, that's the best in the Big 12. So we're going to get a pretty heavy dose of that. Now, the good news would be, you know, at least we do see a steady diet of it in practice, right? Uh, I mean, Kansas sees it. We see it. So when you're looking for something uh, that is really going to test uh, your ability to get off the field, We've talked so many times about what the stretch play can do and how it stresses defenses. It's going to push you laterally. It's difficult to knock them off that sled that they're trying to slide east to west or west to east. Now, they have struggled with protecting the football, uh, as have we. Uh, they're 16th in the Big 12 in turnover margin. But in addition to the outside zone, Owen, they'll run some gap. They, they run, even though it's not a ton, it's still more counters than anybody else in the conference. And they'll even run some Q counter. I mean, I see them on like third and two, third and three. They'll dial up, dial up some quarterback uh, counter with Jalen. And, of course, he's very effective with that. Uh, but as a team, a lot of yards after contact as a team. So Devin's not the only one doing that. Uh, again, Jalen Daniels, another guy that has only scrambled five times. So much like Garrett, and I think he's kind of settling back into the saddle after being gone for so long. Here's what I found interesting. And this is the type of thing I'm watching tape. I'm like, I need some numbers to back up what I'm seeing. It very much seemed like Jalen Daniels was struggling against one high safety looks. Now, without getting too technical, that can be cover one, which is man free with a safety high and you're splattering underneath and man coverage. Or it can be cover three. You got what we used to call a jack in the middle, a safety in the middle, and you're running a three deep zone. Uh, against cover one, and that typically means you're going to be bringing pressure. Uh, he He's only completed 39% of his throws, one touchdown against three picks. Now, what's interesting, his intended air yards, that's a metric, guys, that they track whether it's completed or not. They just every throw you make, they track and see how far in the air it actually was. His intended air yards versus man free, 425 yards, which is the second most against man free coverage in all of power forward. What he's doing a lot of is when he sees man free and he sees the blitz package, he's not comfortable diagnosing underneath his quick answer throws. He's pushing the football vertical and taking shots and he hasn't hit a lot of them. So that's kind of what we've seen. But what's interesting is even when you're running cover three, now sometimes you might confuse him and roll to it and he doesn't entirely understand what he's looking at. But in cover three, which is Typically, once you settle into it, it's pretty basic and vanilla. You can high low and you have a lot of options. You attack the quick flat. Guys, he hasn't made much hay. He's 36% his completion rate against cover three, which is also the worst in the Big 12. But this just in for a struggling quarterback who has turned the football over at all turns 
the tonic you might need to find is a West Virginia defense, which is 14th in the Big 12 against the pass. Yes, there are actually two teams behind us. And doesn't force turnovers. And doesn't force turnovers. That's just it. Doesn't force turnovers. I'm, I'm going to hit some numbers here with you. It'll drive you crazy. But, guys, second down. Again, I, I preached this throughout the course of the game. We saw it. It started really with Albany, to some extent with Penn State, but we got a heavy dose of it with Albany. We were dominating on first down. We were knocking them so far off schedule, they couldn't see the schedule. And yet second and long, second and very long, didn't benefit us. The same thing last week in Pittsburgh. West Virginia's defensive pass rating on second down is 240. The second worst in the country is Florida at 184. We're 240. On second down, quarterbacks have completed 73% of their throws, 13.2 yards per attempt, five touchdowns, and of course, no picks because we don't have a pick yet. Now, once again, let's go back to intended air yards. Teams are taking shots on us, against us, on second down. Sometimes they're off schedule, so they say, heck with it, it's good as a punt, I'm going to take a shot. Well, they might draw a PI, or they might complete the pass in a 50-50 ball. They're intended, the opposition's intended air yards against West Virginia on second down is 439, the most in all of Power 4. So if it seems like second downs have been a steady diet of teams attacking us, there are the numbers to support it. You don't have to wonder anymore. Yards per coverage snap on second down, also the highest. So we have been getting just gashed on second down or often second long. Now, here's what's interesting. Yes, we've given up 15, or excuse me, uh, completions of 15 plus yards uh, on second down. We are, we've already given up a dozen, and that's the most in FBS. So this is just in second down has been a disaster, even or especially second and long. Meanwhile, this is where it gets curious. West Virginia's defense on first down has held the opposition to a completion percentage of 47%, six best in the FBS. So, again, it doesn't just seem like we're winning on first down. We are. It doesn't just seem like we're getting dominated on second down. We are. There are numbers to support that. Now, you might be wondering, what does that mean for Jalen Daniels? Well, let's look at it like this. Jalen Daniels is a first down passer. We talked about, hey, we're pretty successful on first down. He's only completed 50% of his first down throws. That's worse than the Big 12. Why is it worse than the Big 12? Because all advantages tend to tilt toward the quarterback on first down. That is the down that he has most of the advantages heading his direction because the defense truly doesn't know what's coming. So he's last in the Big 12 with a 50% completion rate on first down. West Virginia, sixth in the country in completion percentage defensively on first down. Now let's go to second down. We talked about our struggles. He's 62% on the second down. But, guys, he's not taking a bunch of shots. He hasn't even thrown for 100 yards on the second down. It's more underneath controlled passing. So I'm quite certain that's going to change on Saturday because they're watching the same tape that we watched. So expect them for the first time this year to take those shots on second down. Now, who are they going to take those shots to? They have an incredibly veteran receiver group. I mean, these dudes have all been there forever. Uh, most targeted kid is Luke Grimm. He's their slot, 6'1", 190. He's a shifty kid. And trust me when I say is some somebody who has seen him up close and personal, he's supremely confident. OK, he is very confident in what he does. Uh, I, I can attest to that. Uh, but the last time he was here in Morgantown in that win for Kansas two years ago, he had six catches for 66 yards. Guys, he had four first downs. What they were doing, Andy Kotelnicki moving the chess pieces. He was finding ways to isolate Luke Grimm as the slot on Lee Koba, which was a pass defense liability for us. We were trying to avoid it. And they had more success in making it happen, and we had less success in avoiding it. So that's the types of things that I would imagine they'll do. You got another kid in uh, Lawrence Arnold, uh, big, tall, 6'3", 205 kid. They'll kind of take some shots to him. He's he's a big kid, but they haven't – what strikes me, because they got another big kid in Quentin Skinner. He actually had a touchdown in that game here in Morgantown in 22. They all contributed in that game in 22. But – he only has four catches, but they've thrown his way 15 times. I mean, they push it up. But what they don't have is a group yet. And let's keep it this way as we're trying to break in some new corners, which we'll talk about here in a second. They don't have a contested catch yet this year through three games. They're a group of receivers. 
So it's not as though they're dominating 50-50 balls. So it's a secondary that has struggled against 50-50 balls against a group of receivers that hasn't made any 50-50 catches. So stay tuned to that matchup. And when you look on the other side of the ball, if you want to jump to West Virginia's defensive line, Guys, Wes, I told you before we came on the air, I'm I'm convinced if you're going to see any kind of good things happen from this football team, especially on the defensive side, if there's any kind of good things in front of us, I think it's it's almost necessarily going to start with this defensive line Uh, because there are some things I see on tape that flash promise. There really are, Uh, starting with T.J. Jackson. I mean, we all know the splash that he's made, but here's here's what happened against Pitt. Uh, First of all, the offense helped because even though we were facing a tempo pit offense, we only faced 59 snaps. So we were concerned all week about what that defensive line rotation would be with coach Jackson, trying to shuffle his guys on and off the field with limited opportunities to do so. Uh, TJ played 47 snaps. Um, Sean, 46 snaps. Asani, 27. Hammond Russell, 26. Patorma, 21. Nate Gabriel had nine. We're going to see more from him. Uh, Here's something that stands out as I watch these guys. Uh, We have 44 hurries this year. Uh, Here's why that's promising. 44 quarterback hurries this year. We're averaging 14.7 per game. Last year, we finished the season averaging 8.4. So we're getting after the quarterback much more effectively without the second level. You know, I'm I'm just focused more on the defensive line. Uh, But then the bandits have pitched in, you know, with, with their share as well. But that's what I'm seeing with this group. And I do think TJ... TJ's fourth in FBS with 12 hurries already. Guys, Nate Gabriel, nine snaps, okay, against Pitt. He's played 33 snaps for the season, and he already has three hurries. This big 300-pound bear plant holding down the nose. We we got some wiggle in these guys. I mean, you've seen some good things out of Asani with four hurries. Sean has seven hurries. So if you continue to improve in that group, I think we got a chance to be pretty good. And then we'll see what happens on the second and third levels. And speaking of the third level, you heard the staff talk this week about with the struggles on the back end, of course, you're going to try new pieces and new personnel. Uh, the two names that uh, that were mentioned, Jacoby Spells and TJ Crandall, uh, two very different players. Uh, Jacoby Spells has played a lot of football for us. Of course, he was banged up in the spring. He was having a terrific spring. That kind of knocked him off course. Uh, just recently came back at full strength. Uh, He's played almost 400 career snaps here. He's played a lot of football. So if his time is now, he needs to be ready. And we're about to find out. And then TJ Crandall, TJ Crandall is wickedly young as a true freshman at Colorado state last year. He had over 300 snaps playing against pretty good competition. He was effective, uh, which is why we signed him and brought him in through the portal. He might be the fastest in the room. He's incredibly athletic So let's see how that goes. And the other thing about it, Owen, is, look, you have to think there's some competitors in that room or they wouldn't have got to where they're at. And if you're some of those other corners and these guys are being inserted in front of you, well, now when you get your next opportunities, let's see how that works out. If, in fact, it means to you what it should mean to you. So, I mean, those are the types of things that we've been looking at, that we've been discussing. And. I want to get your comments on that. We're going to hit some some miscellaneous topics, and I'll close with the quarterbacks and some miscellaneous topics. Yeah, I mean, I'm right there with you. We got to get pressure on uh, on Daniels and uh, just get him uncomfortable. It'd be nice to kind of see some of those hurries turn into actual sacks. Um, you know, just you know, making some yeah. more plays on the quarterback. Uh, it's going to be key this week. He's obviously such a huge proponent. We got to stuff Neil. Um, you know, like you said, Devin, super dynamic, you know, I want to see Tr- Trotter is a dog, dude, dog yeah. Trotter is an absolute dog. I love him, man. He is a football player. He is a football player. And just to, uh, kind of talk about what you were saying with the secondary, you know, that's why I always kind of question what new age football is really about with, you know, how you practice. Uh, because I feel like you know, so many people are brother-in-law, you know what I mean? Or, or, or not so much brother-in-law, but there's so much less contact in practice. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Are, are those, are those guys really exactly going, saying, yeah. 
Huh? Yeah, I know exactly what are they going, that makes sense. Yeah, are they really going as hard uh to to you know to really show uh, you know what they can do? I hope if they do get opportunities, they take the most advantage of them because you know, like we pointed out at the start of the the, the program here, the program, program, um, there is a lot of football left, and we do have, you know, it isn't so doom and gloom. We have time, but you know, obviously this week, you know, nut up or shut up. Let's let's clean slate it. Let's play some real defense. Let's play some real offense. Let's play a complete game. Okay, don't have to be perfect. Let's just get the things dialed in that we need to do. D-line, take care of business. Move the line of scrimmage, right? Make the quarterback rush and make mistakes. Linebackers, make them pay for it, all right? And secondary, man up, win some of those 50-50s. Uh, you know, there's an there's a certain attitude, you know, I want to keep seeing progress as well, you know what I mean? Not so much this, right? I want to see this. I want to see these guys doing the talking. So uh, I, I think if we do that going forward here, you know, both teams are going to be hungry this weekend, right? This is kind yep. of deciding factor with how the rest of the season is going to go. So we'll, we'll see what happens. And Wes, I, you know, I know there was a lot of rambling in there. Hopefully you got a tidbit of information out of me. Listen, they better be hungry. They better be ready to go. They better nut up or shut up all those things you're talking about because listen, that's the that is the crazy and the beautiful thing about this sport too. As like football is the sport that we react the most, overreact the most to every result, good or bad. Because think about it. Uh for us, we get to watch our favorite team play 12 times a year. And if we're being honest, it's not quite the same when they take the field against Albany, all due respect to the Great Danes, obviously. So it's really only like 11 games a year that you get really hyped for. If you're a if you're a baseball fan, your team plays 162 games a year. If you're a basketball or a hockey fan, your team plays 82 games a year. Even now in the NFL, they play 17 regular season, plus three preseason, plus the playoffs has expanded another round. More teams, more playoffs in the NFL than ever before. You're guaranteed 12 games of your Mountaineers, your favorite team. It's very easy in the good times to go crazy and overreact and in the bad times to go crazy and overreact. Um, but I think this is the time of the season where water starts to find its level. You know, who That's you really you that, who you really are about mid to late September comes out and then rolls into October and November and – as much as it sucks and as much as what happened last week will always be a part of the story of this season, this season story ain't written yet. So that can be the depressing, you know, pre-log here. That could be the depressing forward, that backyard brawl loss to a Big 12 campaign that saved the season. Or it could be the, what, the, the, the start of the, you know, the real doom and gloom. So I, I, I'm with, I'm with you, Oh, everything particularly from a pride standpoint, right, is is on, is literally on the field on Saturday afternoon. Yeah, and, and Wes, it's funny you'd say that because I always heard from folks down that way about Gary Patterson when he was winning all those league titles and multiple conferences down at TCU. He never liked to recruit baseball players because he said losing didn't hurt them enough because they had to manage accepting losing because they played so many games. You can't go undefeated in baseball every year. So they just don't understand or appreciate what you're supposed to feel like when you lose a competition. But so the, yeah, that, that's a great point. And let, let's hit a couple special teams bullets. And again, I'm going to hit some quarterback stuff and moving on. But okay. first of all, when you hit the miscellaneous topic, when Lance Leipold took this job, he didn't get there until after the spring and everybody marveled at how quickly he turned this thing around by late in the year. He went on the road and he beat Texas, the bluest of blue bloods, the orangest of orange blue bloods. He beat Texas on the road. And trust me when I say the next week we were in Lawrence and we knew it wasn't already. wasn't the same old Kansas. Even then, even though the personnel was the same mentality is such a huge part of football. Well, what that 21 team did, they weren't winning a lot of games, but they were far more competitive than they had any business doing. They were profoundly disciplined. 
they committed the fewest penalties in the entire Big 12. Well, the guys, last year, again, nine and four is an achievement for them, no doubt about it. But it didn't feel to a lot of folks like it necessarily should have. They thought they left some things on the table. Even with their backup quarterback and their preseason, you know, offensive player of the year on the shelf, well, their backup quarterbacks in the NFL now. But last year, they didn't finish first in penalty avoidance in the Big 12. They were next to last. Last week, in the loss to UNLV, they were flagged nine times for 90 yards. So it almost has a bit of a feel. Now, that's not to say he can't circle the wagons and redirect and fix that thing too sweet right away. But the little things that were helping him be competitive when he shouldn't have been that first year, they're not necessarily doing as well or as consistently recently. Could flip a switch and change sure, Saturday. Sure. But that's what I've seen. And then, once again, we're going to face another dude kicking the ball off. 94% touchbacks. Big surprise, Tabor Allen. Uh, Michael Hayes, 11%. Two out of bounds. We've got to, we have to rectify the kickoff situation. Uh, they got a punter. Here's what's interesting. We might have some opportunities for P-Fox. Damon Greaves, he's averaging almost 50 yards a punt, but he hasn't punted much. But his hang time is second lowest in the Big 12. A lot of line drives, so opportunities for returns. They've already had four returns on his five punts, so let's see if that's going to matter. Uh, and then let, let's go to the quarterback, because I broke down their numbers against the Blitz and looked at this and looked at that and wanted to find what was worth talking about. Here's what's worth talking about. West Virginia and Kansas are both in the bottom of the Big 12 in turnover margin. We're 15th, they're 16th. Jalen Daniels and Garrett Green have the most turnover-worthy plays, seven each, in the Big 12. Turnover-worthy, we've talked about it before. It should be a turnover even if it's not. Dropped interception, whatever the case might be. They each have seven, most in the Big 12. Guys, Garrett only had eight turnover-worthy plays all of last year. The very first podcast we did, we were previewing the offense. Don't get knocked backwards and continue to demonstrate great ball security. Those are the two hidden gems from last year's offense. We've already been sacked five times with Garrett. We were sacked five times with Garrett, 10 as a team, but five with Garrett all of last year. Stop moving backwards. The O-line keeps getting better each week. Stop putting the football in harm's way. Play smarter football. Now, here's what's funny, guys. Almost ironic. Only one player in the entire country has more turnover-worthy plays than Jalen Daniels and Garrett, who have seven each. This guy has eight. Guess yeah, who know, that is? I know who it is. It's Pitt's quarterback who's throwing up freaking rainbows the in the we triple couldn't cover. Force a turnover yeah, against thanks, last week. Jed. That Appreciate it. Thanks change. for ruining my day again. See ya. That needs to change. <laughs> <laughs> there it goes. You hey Jed, go just to know two to row against guys that are sloppy hey, with the ball and not force turnovers. <laughs> Hey, just just on a quick note too, as far as special teams go, they're coming. Mm -hmm. All right, because anytime you get one blocked the previous week, yeah. they're Struck they're going to have some sort of special teams play. They're coming on punts, so call, just be yeah. be ready. Especially yeah. when it's punt safe and they block it. <laughs> Great call. Yeah, Great be call. ready. I'm just telling uh, you right now. It, it's all about how you respond after be, after getting knocked out. All right. It's all about how you respond after you get knocked out. It ain't about how hit, hard again, you right? can. It ain't about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. That's right. Don't Another, let Pitt beat you a third time. Listen, Jed, if you mention that game again, I'm done. I'm tenuring my resignation right here on the show. <laughs> one more time. That's it. That's two strikes. Third strike, and I'm out. Now with Johnson Equipment, get 0% financing for 72 months plus a free loader on select Coyote models in stock. Visit Johnson yeah. Equipment on Route 33 between Weston and Buchanan. Okay, a uh, quick last break here and then just a couple minutes on the other side to give our weekly Big 12 picks before we get up out of here. You are in the gun. There are better known tractors in the world than Coyote. Ones with bigger names, longer histories, more popular hats cute toy lines but there's not a single tractor ever been built that's better equipped to do the dirty work so we'll just focus on what really matters coyote we dig dirt 
Now at Johnston Equipment, get 0% financing for 72 months, plus a free loader on select Coyote models in stock. Visit us on Route 33 between Weston and Buchanan. All right, back in the gun as we wrap up this episode of ITG. It's time for our weekly Big 12 Pick'em. Uh, but, Jed, before we uh, each give our picks for this week, a quick recap for you from how we did last week. Yeah, let's start with this. Shout out to a couple listeners and or viewers. Uh, once again, we encourage you each week to try and beat the four of us. You can go to our Twitter account at In the Gun Podcast. The pinned tweet has the document. All you got to do is log in, make your picks, and see how you do. Uh, last week, guys, we had, in terms of someone picking most points scored by a Big 12 team, nobody got that one right. None of our listeners, none of our viewers. Fewest points allowed. We had one listener, viewer, get it correct. Landon from North Carolina got it correct. Oh, good on you, Landon from North Carolina. Most rushing yards. Which team would rush for the most yards? We had two, get it, get it right, excuse me, Landon again. He had two of them, fellas. Uh, he's humming. And Jesse from Tampa, Florida. And then finally, most passing yards by a Big 12 offense. Nobody got that one right. Zero. So here is how we did. Of course, last week, Iowa State did not play. So that means there were 15 teams instead of 16 in action. Oh, now it's fun to remember we instituted our new rule last week. The rule is if you are the weekly winner among the four of us, you can pick one fellow competitor and block one team from their picks. The fun part about last week, Skyler didn't know he was the winner, but he didn't know who Owen had picked. And he blocked UCF. And sure enough, Owen had picked UCF and he was blocked from doing so. So he had to go with option B. Uh, he picked Kansas instead. UCF, of course, ended up running for the most yards in the Big 12. Owen would have won five points, but instead, Kansas ran for 199, which was eighth in the Big 12, zero points instead of five. So already we see the effect of the block rule, the Skyler rule. <laughs> Passing offense, I picked Colorado. Uh, Colorado finished five out of 15 Big 12 teams. We had some 400-yard uh, passing performances, guys. Oklahoma State, 454 against Tulsa. TCU, 402 against UCF. Uh, Texas Tech had a day. BYU went for 318. Colorado was 310 yards against rival Colorado State, so I get one point. Scoring defense. Wes, you got zero. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll move on. Last time, uh, I, last time I vote with my heart instead of my head. Scoring offense. <laughs> Skyler picked Oklahoma State to score the most points. Texas Tech actually scored the most, 66 against North Texas. But Oklahoma State went on the road to Tulsa and came in at number two, 45 points on the board for the Pokes. So Skyler finished two, number two out of 15 Big 12 teams. So he is awarded four points. So Skyler is once again the winner which means Skyler once again got to exercise the block. And this week, Wes, do you want to explain who he blocked? Yeah, I mean, smart strategy by Skyler. He blocked me from taking the Iowa State defense because Iowa State is the only Big 12 team that isn't playing a Power 5 opponent, a fellow Big 12 opponent this week. So, yes, good work there by Skyler. Very smart, but I got a strategy for him. Don't you worry, Jed. Okay. You, okay, you, you want me to well, roll? Let's, well, let's start then. Yeah, I mean, so Skyler, let's give okay. his pick since he came in first yeah, and do. he's yeah. and he's not yeah. here. Uh, yeah. What do you got? Wait, hold on. I'm looking. Oh, he'll go Texas Tech this week. So uh, again, if you just for those unfamiliar, Jed picks Signal Caller, which is which offense is going to throw for the most yards. Owen picks Beer Truck, which offense is going to run for the most yards. Skyler picks which offense is going to score the most points. I pick which defense is going to give up the fewest amount of points. So Skyler will take Texas Tech this week at home against Arizona State to score the most points in the conference. Uh, Jed, who you got as your Signal Caller? Skyler with no wow. respect for the fight McKinney, I, Kenny Dillingham's against undefeated ASU. Wow, that's bold. That's bold. Okay. Uh, you know, I flirted with Texas Tech, but I I think I think Arizona State's a little salty on defense. Uh more, more so than they're, they're tired of hearing how bad they are, much like we were last year. Um, uh, so I, I don't have as much faith in Baron Morton. 
as I have in Hoover. So I'm going to take TCU in a rivalry game against SMU to throw for the most Ooh. yards. Let's go. They had a big day last week. Let's hope they have two in a row. But typically, it doesn't work out that way. But here we go. That's who I'm picking. Okay. TCU. Here's my pick. All right. I'm going with WVU this week. Let's go. Run it, run it down their dang throats, boys. Let's go, baby. I, I'm I'm tired. I listen, I have the I told the people to believe. All right. It's time to stat this weekend. We gotta run the football. That's one thing that we have been doing. Let's keep doing that. I like that pick, Big O. That's a good pick. I'm gonna go Cincinnati, the Bearcats at home against the Cougs as my defense, Big 12 defense of the week. I just think Houston stinks and is going to struggle to get out of neutral. That one will be relatively low scoring, um, but I think Houston is just going to struggle to score all year as a a team and an offense that has completely hit the reset button here in the uh, post-Dana Holgerson era. So give me the Bearcats of Cincinnati as my defense of the week, and that will do it for the picks. All right, fellas, any last words before we close this down? We good? Everybody good? Thumbs of course, Thumbs your surprise up. was because you were blocked, but that's four surprises. Four surprises. Win, baby. Oh, wow. I mean, that's not a bad one. When you look at the matchups, that's, yeah. But interest, more interesting picks, very good picks. Uh, same business as always, too. Listen, I'm a sucker for pain, okay? I'll be there in the peach lot. Look for the Grateful Dead WV flag. Look for the ITG football flag. Uh, I won't be there quite as early this week as I typically am because I'm bringing the, uh, the two kiddos. And I'm just not trying to tailgate with a, a three-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old for hours. So maybe just like, you know, like 90 minutes or so. But I will be there in the peach lot if uh, if anybody wants to say hello. And, uh, hey, let's go get a W. Let's go start the conference slate out 1-0. and Let's allow ourselves to still have some, some goals on the horizon here. Let's go get it done and uh, get some mouthwash for that stank that we're all still – dealing with from this past Saturday up there in Pittsburgh. Uh, A big thanks to our guy Skylar for throwing this together for us as always for the runaway beer truck, big O the signal caller, Jed Drenning. I'm Wes Shuler. The one thing we ask of you is to be an ear and tell an ear about your new favorite WVU football podcast. Take care, everybody. Phil Steele still coming on Friday this week. So plenty more to get to before kickoff on Saturday. Take care. And you've been in the gun. I-T-G. The fun doesn't have to stop here. Be sure to hit subscribe and never miss an episode. If you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, be sure to follow us on X at In The Gun Podcast. Join us again next time. Until then. Tell an ear to tell an ear about your new favorite WVU football podcast. This mission is over. It's over.